start the recording then. Okay, we're recording now. Um, okay, so welcome to room one. Um, this is our focus discussion with CPFE owners and operators. And it looks like we just have two people in the room right now. So Tim and Sean, welcome. Um, and I guess we kind of want to jump into things. Um, so we have time to discuss everything. Um, but my name is Christine Lucina. I'm an environmental scientist based in the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, and I'm going to facilitate the room today. Um, I've been working on halibut for about 10 years in that area, and my focus and interest has always been on studying halibut biology and life history, but I also really love being in the field and working directly with the fishermen um, and learning about fishery operations. Um, and so on that note, I'll pass it over to Chuck and Sarah to introduce themselves. Okay. I'm uh, Chuck Valley. I'm a senior environmental scientist with the department. I work out of the Los Alamitos office in Southern California, and I've been with the department for 30 years. Um, I do fish for halibut, uh, mostly from beaches or a float tube. However, I do ride aboard party boats as much as I can. Uh, usually down here, we're chasing yellowtail or the tunas, um, and I like to fish for kelp bass as well. And like Christine, I'm here to help facilitate this meeting. I feel like I've been talking a lot. I'm Sarah, you've heard my voice. Pleasure to be here. I will be taking notes um, and listening and I will also be helping to report out when we get back to Planary. And just <clears throat> to, to flag Christine and Chuck, we do have Eddie who's joined us and also Santos. So just making sure you know we have two additional folks. Um, well, Tim, you introduced yourself earlier, but do you want to give it another quick introduction, um, maybe just your port um, and uh, maybe your vessel name, um, and then also Eddie and Sean, if you could introduce yourselves after that. Sure. Um, so my vessel name is Real Steel, and I operate out of uh, Woodley Island, which is located in Humboldt Bay. Um, Eddie? You want to introduce yourself? I'm Ed Tavasiev. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yeah. 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 I'm Ed Tavasiev. Um, I'm a commercial hook and line fisherman. I'm just kind of surprised there aren't very many uh, CPFB guys in this room here. Yeah, same. Um, that's very surprising to me. So where did everybody go? <laughs> yeah, yeah that's a good question. It seemed like we had seven people that affiliated with this group at the beginning of the poll, but yeah, I don't yeah know. <laughs> um, it's gonna be hard to have a discussion here, but yeah, just, I was kind of wanting to be more like the fly on the wall because I am a commercial fisherman. I know this is recreational format, but uh, I did want to see what the transcript was going to be, how the presentation was going to go, and get kind of prepared for the commercial aspect of it. But I also wanted to see the CPFB uh, scope and also see how they have any, if, if they have any ideas or ideas that they want to present and maybe look at different ways of uh, managing the fishery that was exclusive to CPFV. Okay, thanks Ed, thanks for joining. Um, Sean? Yeah, I'm gonna continue our weirdness because I'm not, I also, <laughs> um, this was sort of, I thought this would be interesting to also be a fly on the wall in this one. So I'm a professor, so I study um, uh, fishing behavior and, uh, and what types of seafood are being made available in uh, coastal ports in California. And so, uh, yeah, I, I don't own a vessel. Uh, I, um, uh, when I do fish, I spear fish. So I'm, I usually am underwater, not on the surface when I'm looking for stuff. Very cool, welcome. Um, Santos, you wanna introduce yourself really quickly? Sure. Good evening, folks. My name is uh, Santos Cabral. I'm a um, warden with the California Department of Fish and Wildlife out of the Monterey Field Office. Uh, I started back in uh, 1996 down in Southern California, primarily out of the Ventura Channel Islands area, um, now assigned out of uh, the Monterey Field Office covering uh, Año Nuevo, Farallons, Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary. And uh, I'm here to help out. Um, in any way I can. Thank you for uh, allowing me to participate in this discussion this afternoon. Yeah, thanks for joining. Um, okay, well, I guess we should jump into our discussion questions. So I'm gonna share my screen, um, one second. 
Okay, so I think you guys should see the um, group discussion notes. Is that right? Um, where it says room one at the top, CPF. Yeah, we can see it. We can see it. Operators. Okay, cool. Um, okay, so our, our first question is um, from a CPFB owner operator perspective um, How does California Halibut contribute to your personal livelihood? I guess I'm the one who should answer that, huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody's looking at you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, so we're in a unique situation here in Humboldt County. It's a little different than like the Bay Area. And I'm sorry that uh, there aren't uh, some CPFV owners from there because it's probably more important to them. Um, we have pretty rough ocean conditions where we are and uh, there's a lot of days. In fact, uh, this May, we only were able to fish nine days in the ocean because it was so rough. Um, the fishing in for California halibut in the bay is uh, an option for us when we can't get out and fish, uh, fish out in the ocean, you know, for other species like uh, salmon or Pacific halibut or rockfish. So in that respect, it's really important if it was a more um, consistent fishery for us for from year to year, it would probably be even more important. But what seems to happen here is that uh, we have a year class that's fairly large that will come into Humboldt Bay. And it doesn't seem like they stay here all winter, like maybe they leave in November or so, and they'll come back next uh, May or June, but that one year class will come in and uh, we'll get almost all shorts for uh, for a year. And then the next year will be a mix of shorts and uh, legal fish. And then uh, we'll get mostly legal fish. And by then that year class is starting to be impacted pretty heavily uh, by fishing pressure and um, we see it start to diminish and then after another year or two it'll actually be diminished to the point where it's not uh, even a, uh, a reliable fishery and then it seems like a few years later uh, another year class will pop in here and honestly you know you guys are the biologists and stuff and I, I don't know why that is and why that happens that way but, you know, I've fished here for 50 some years and um, in the last 30 years, I've seen three cycles like that where the fish have come in. We've had very good fishing for a few years and then uh, and then it's over and it would last longer if there was less pressure on it. You know, the, the bay and where the fish are located in the bay is actually a fairly small area when you you know, when you break it down that, uh, you know, the fish may go up on the flats during a high tide, but at the low tide, a lot of the bay is exposed. So then it's all, almost like uh, a series of sloughs and rivers where all of these fish are located. So it ends up being that there's not a, a large uh, geographical area for the fish, even though sometimes there's seems like a large quantity of fish. Yeah, that's really, that's so interesting. It's like similar to San Francisco Bay and that and what you're saying about there being like rough weather out on the ocean and the bay being like in a good second option um, to save a fishing trip um, just because it's calmer in that area. Um, is there is there anything else to fish for in Humboldt Bay or is halibut kind of the only option? Um, in San Francisco, we have striped bass um, yep. as well, but I was wondering if you guys have anything else. No, we don't, we don't have striped bass. I mean, we have sharks and bat rays, you know, leopard sharks, that sort of oh, thing. Okay. That's really not a fishery that anybody, you know, yeah. on a regular basis. So if it's rough weather and there's no California halibut around, then you don't really have another option for the day. That's correct. Yeah. Okay. okay. So, so in that respect, it's pretty important. Yeah. You know. Right. Yeah. 
So Tim, I have a question for you. Sure. Uh, is, it, is there any of uh, anybody commercial fishing up there for the California halibut? Commercial fishing? Yeah. That's a good question. So there's not a consistent commercial fishery. I had an experience last year where I ran into a guy in a small uh, recreational boat and he came up and asked uh, if we were catching any, any fish and stuff. And he told me that he caught so many fish the year before and had to let them all go that he went and got a commercial license so that he could keep more fish, which it really is, it is not the purpose of a commercial fishing license. And for the same reason that it's not a consistent, it's not a consistent fishery for us. It's really not something that a commercial fisherman could make a it's basically a beer money fishery for them. Okay, well, what I'm getting at is not necessarily that it's worth it or not, but a matter of fact, uh, are they trying any other different geographies? Like, are they trying outside of Humboldt Bay? Because I know you have large beach areas outside of Humboldt Bay, and uh, there's enough habitat to support uh, the fishery outside of that bay as well. Not the fishery, but to support the species as well. So you're saying your classes come in and go out but then what's supporting the year classes that you are getting and you're seeing? There has to be some contributing uh, biomass that's gonna to contribute to that. What? So I was just wondering, do you have any other areas that are tried outside of the Bay that are not exclusive to just inside of Humboldt Bay? So there has been a lot of, uh, not a lot, but there has been occasional effort out outside of the Bay and stuff. And it's interesting that they catch California halibut in uh, Shelter Cove and uh, even up in uh, um, Crescent City off of South Beach. Um, but we rarely, you know, even mooching for salmon if you're on the bottom or fishing for sand abs or fishing anything that you would fish for on the beach, rarely, I mean, extremely rarely, do we ever catch a California halibut outside of Humboldt Bay. Hmm. So, so Tim, I have a question. So when did you start having a good fishery up there? I mean, going back in time, um, cause it probably hasn't always been that way. Right. Um, so the first time that I know that it was a good fishery was probably about 20 years ago. Okay. And, um, but I know, you know, for a while they were doing uh, trawls in the bay to actually um, eliminate bat rays for um, because of their impacts to the oyster farms. Right. And they don't do that anymore, of course. But that's, I think that's how they started finding more California halibut in the bay. And that's and we didn't have live bait and uh, um, somebody started a live bait um, uh, concession. And I, those things both combined to start a fishery. But like I said, it, the fishery was really good for a few years and then it went away basically completely. Um, and, then, and then a few years later after that, then it popped back up again with, you know, short fish, like one big year class with maybe an occasional mm -hmm. exception to that. Okay. Another couple of questions for you. Um, what would you consider a good season? How do you, how do you, how do you gauge that? Oh, I would say, so probably four years ago, the start of this last uh, real good um, run, we, we could catch, we're getting a lot of shorts, but we were catching 30 to 60 fish a trip um, with a lot of, you know, shorts being released and stuff. So that was very consistent and that was something we could do daily. And now, I mean, it's great because we would be fishing a mile from where, um, where the, where our boats are tied up and stuff. So, you know, the fuel costs and stuff are quite low. Uh, people don't get seasick. Um, the fishery is still fun and kind of exciting and you, you get some good, uh, um, table fare out of the deal and stuff. So all of those things make it, if it was reliable for year after year after year, it would be an awesome fishery. Another, another question I had for you was also, um, what would you consider your size class, like pounds or, or I don't know how you, how you gauge your fish, or whether you measure them or you weigh them in weight, but uh, what would you consider your average size fish that you catch? Well, since it's one year class that kind of moves through from year to year, 
five years ago, we were getting mostly short fish, you know, in the 18 to um, 23 inch range. Then the next year they would be somewhat longer. This year, um, very few fish were undersized. Almost all the fish were over 22 inches and uh, a lot of fish up to uh, 30 pounds were caught. So in the, probably the 15 pounds, probably this year, probably eight to 15 pound range would be the average. Thank you. So Tim, do you Can see- I pause for a moment? Sorry, Chuck. Sure. I just wanted to check in um, with Tim, Eddie, Sean, if this is feeling comfortable or if you would like to be merged with the recreational breakout no, it's great. room. And just I'm know Christine good. and Chuck. Thank you. Okay. Good. Is this feeling comfortable? We're okay, fine Sean, so far, yeah. Thank you. Later on, if you want to merge, it's fine, but for now, we're fine. Okay. And thank Tim, you. just recognizing you're our only CPSV, so how are you feeling? Oh, no, I think this is great. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> <That's what's happening. laughs> That's that's great. I just I just wanted to check in with the team because I let folks know we only had one CPSV, so just behind the scenes and wanted to offer that um, support. But let's so, carry on. Sorry so for interrupting. Was also, how many how many other CPFV boats are operating out of your port there that are targeting uh, the halibut in your halibut in the Humboldt Bay there? Okay, that's a good question. So when I started about 15 years ago, there were two CPFVs, and I made number three, and that lasted for about. 10 years and so about five years ago we started picking up one or two more and a couple more till this year there's probably 15 they're all they're all six packs or no uh, um inspected vessels in that was Bay. my next question six packs yeah yeah and, are and, you and, a six pack vessel i'm a six pack vessel yes. and, and and tim did those folks did those folks um were they like commercial fishermen i mean did they move from somewhere else or did they start up or no they're um they, they've come from various uh different areas i'll just put it that way a lot of uh, uh you know humble state has a good fisheries program and stuff so some of the graduates from there you know um want to stay and get into something and and then it's, it, it's actually a pretty big variety of guys that have got into the fishery what's happening now is the salmon fishery on the klamath river is in such bad shape that a lot of the river guides are able to use their river boats in the bay. And um, that's added a lot of pressure the last two years from those guys that uh, that was never, if they were, if the Klamath was doing good, then we wouldn't have any of those guys in there. But there's been several of them fishing consistently in the bay here that they, that that didn't happen before. Yeah, we see that up and down the coast. But the shift of effort from impacted fisheries. Yeah, we see that up and down the coast. Yeah. Tim, I, I'm wondering, you mentioned the boomer bust kind of fishing that you have for halibut up there. Do you also see that reflected in the ridership aboard your CPFEs? So you see much less patronage when you have halibut in a down year versus being in an up year, or does it matter? Um, it, so my business, I've been here a while, so my business is very consistent. We book, we're basically booked solid from May till October, you know, every day. And we book early, so probably by May, we're probably 80% booked for all of that time. So then it's just a matter of what's available to fish for. And if the ocean is rough and we can't get out and we don't have the California halibut, then that's a day that gets canceled and we're not able to fish. So if the, if the California halibut are available in the bay, then we um, are able to fish a lot more days. Makes a big difference. And we can fish every day then. Oh, okay. And, and how many people are generally on, on your CPFE? We normally take five or six people. Okay. Because I'm wondering down here in Southern California, you know, we have up to 40 plus people on CPFEs. So it, it's big difference. Right. Those, those are inspected vessels. And it's too bad none of the Bay Area guys are on this. I'm on the Golden Gate Fishermen's Association Board of Directors, and I don't know why, um, why none of those guys joined on. Because I know it's extremely important for some of those boats, you know, especially yeah. in down salmon years. 
Um, kind of on a similar note um, to your passenger level, do you do you think there's a correlation between the California halibut catch and the number of CPFBs operating in your area? Does it fluctuate with halibut, or is it more dependent on some um, on other factors? No, it's actually not fishery dependent at all. It's okay. just people see it and they think it's a good business to get into, and not all of them are making it. Let's Okay. Okay. The dilution factor, too many people in 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 one pot. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. Basically, have a certain amount of people that are going to go on the boats. And then if you use them all up, yeah, nobody makes any money. Yeah. Um, When you notice that times in your port in Humboldt Bay there are low in biomass, are you noticing any increase or um, better fishing at other ports at the same time? Like say Eureka, Crescent City, no need, you know, I'm sure you know guys up and down the coast are gonna tell you, yeah, well, we're having a great year or we're having a bad year. Are you all having, are you all experiencing the similar decline in the fishery or are you all seeing different uh, levels of the fishery? So for the Northern California stuff, it seems to be kind of all correlated. I don't see where it's consistently correlates with the Bay Area's um, California halibut fishing but it is for Shelter Cove and Crescent City and stuff. I think that uh, that might be all the same biomass fish, you know, moving up and down the coast, sir. So what I'm getting at is you're, you have a bad season and everybody else having a bad season as well. It seems that way, yeah. Okay, okay thanks. Okay, so just in the interest of time and hoping that we get through the rest of the questions, um, I'm gonna pull us to the next one. Um, so based on the definition within the MLMA, which is what Kirsten presented er- earlier, um, we want to know what does sustainability mean to you? Um, based on your experience, is California halibut a sustainable fishery? So maybe you already touched on this a little bit, but it sounds like stability is something that is important to you when it comes to sustainability in your area. Yeah. Um, I think that... Uh... I don't know how to describe it really, that uh, a, a consistent fishery would be more what I would, uh, um, would be more important as far as sustainability and stuff, something that would be consistent from year to year rather than just a population that, uh, you know, can support itself. Okay. Have you ever been able to tie the good years uh, any? kind of environmental conditions or other factors? Any insight on that? No, not really. Okay. I, I mean, we've looked for a connection. You know, okay. we, we, we've wondered if maybe there was a warm current, you know, be from south to north, or if there was, a, you know, maybe a different uh, type of bait in the bay. You know, some years we get anchovies, sometimes it's herring, sometimes it's sardines, mostly anchovies, but it doesn't seem like that there's a strong correlation with any of those. Okay. What are your water temperatures in the bay generally? Oh, um, so we have pretty good tides here in the bay. So uh, on a high tide when it's coming in, it can be close to um, sea temperatures, you know, in the low to mid fifties. And then um, later in the, towards the end of the day or if the tides ebbing then, um, it can get up into the mid 60s. Mm-hmm. Solar heating. So Tim, do you do you think the the population's getting fished down or do you think they're moving out of the bay and then returning? Oh, I think they're definitely getting fished down. Okay. I, th- I think that's no doubt. I, I would support some stronger regulations, you know, in, in the bay here, anyways. Okay. Do you ever notice any of the males or uh, females with uh, hydrated eggs or males milting? Do you ever notice any of that? Yeah, <laughs> that's another good question because, um, you know, we've been told that they don't spawn in Humboldt Bay and, and actually I've never seen, you know, an eight inch halibut in the bay. Um, but we do see some that are, um, you know, males that are melting and, um, you know, females that look, I don't know what a, a real ripe 
female halibut looks like, but they do have eggs. Oh, I can tell you all about that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, she's sure. The eggs, the eggs turn clear and they'll just spill out. Um, they're only about a millimeter um, long. They're, they're tiny, um, but you'll see that instead of the typical orange ovary, you'll see just clear eggs spilling out near the vent. And we're seeing them immature eggs. Okay, so, orange. okay, orange and you can't really distinguish individual eggs within yes. the ovary. Okay, okay, interesting. So I think for me to answer this question is kind of on the level of, well, I am a commercial hook and line fisherman. So I think we can all agree on the sustainability is the key factor here. Mm -hmm. But um, we're also talking about economic uh, sustainability as well. I think uh, no, everyone will agree with the fact that biological sustainability is going to support the economic sustainability as well. And that's what I would say even for down here for where I'm in the Bay Area here. That's the same thing. I look at when I have a, someone saying to myself is there's no fish, there's no fishery. So to me, the most important is to maintain your biological sustainability. And what that, what that definition is, is what we need to discuss. Mm -hmm. What is the discussion of sustainability? What, what, what are we talking about? A 30% uh, error, margin error or a leeway or what are we going to, how are we going to uh, define sustainability? That's what I'd like to see and, and discuss. Yeah, I, I would I would follow up that what Eddie was saying there in that there's obviously all the, the regular biological definitions that we all use that are important. But I think um, I think we look at something like squid, right? We huge fishery, we get all the squid and we ship it all to or almost all of it to China to process. Right. And so I think the fact that so much of the halibut um, catch is is goes local and goes into local businesses and everything. I think that, that's that's a key component. And another one that is maybe a little bit subtle, but from our restaurant surveys and our, and our point of sale surveys, um, people know what halibut is. Um, people don't know what rockfish is. I mean, the, the, it's sort of the generic fish or whatever, but, but halibut is one of those species that um, the general public has some sense of identity. And so <clears throat> while that's not exactly a definition of sustainability, I think it, it gives some some opportunities that some of the other fisheries don't have that are just become generic fillets of some unknown something that goes into fish taco or something like that. So I think there's, 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 um, uh, you know, absolutely the, the economic part is part of the, in the sort of the, once it gets landed as part of the sustainability part, but I think halibut is, um, uh, has a lot going for it in terms of being able to educate people and, and stuff of that nature. So, um, yeah, I'll be quiet, but. Um, well, shall we move on to the next question? You guys ready? Sure. Okay. Um, so the next one's about uh, bycatch. Um, so from, from a CPFB perspective, um, do you have concerns about bycatch in, in your fishery um, and how that impacts your livelihood? I know you mentioned catching sublegals, so that would be considered as part of bycatch in, in your fishery. That would probably be about the only bycatch issue that we have. And really, I see people are getting a lot better about their release methods and stuff. I know we're really careful with the fish that we release, you know, with the nets we use and stuff that don't tear the tails. And uh, we try to release them in the water if we can, which you always can't, you know. Um, we don't let them flop on the deck while we measure them, that type of thing. So we're as careful with the... Um, Juveniles as we can be. So, okay. Glad to hear that. I was going to ask you also. Sorry, um, I just wanted to make sure I I caught that. Did you say the only? I feel like I missed the very beginning. But what is the only bycatch issue? I, I got the rest about the handling of the fish. Oh, the the um, smaller fish, sublegal fish. Sublegal, yeah. Oh, thank you. Sorry about that. Thanks a lot. I was going to ask you also, what kind of rig are you using? Are you using the trap rigs or are you using single hooks? Single hook. Very good. Yes, yeah, so I answer this again on a commercial level here. I don't know if you want me to answer this, this question here about bycatch. 
my our hook and line bycatch is, is minimal at best. I mean, we do catch other things, but occasionally it's not something that I, I, I would even consider. But as hook and line fishermen, you'll know it's very simple and to easily to release anything caught as incidental catch or whatever that, that's not marketable. Um, any other species, Jim? In San Francisco, we have things like sturgeon, which are sensitive species. And um, then we also have incidental catch, which um, striped bass, for example, would be something that um, the CPFBs are, are getting and then and retaining. Um, I've caught two sturgeon in the last 30 years. So I don't think that's a real, a, a real issue. Um, Probably the thing we catch the most other than we catch an occasional leopard shark and um, Pacific staghorn sculpin. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it's a real bait. problem. <laughs> no. It might be. Uh, it can be. Um, okay, next question. Um, how, oh, if it, oh, oh, go ahead, Ed. Uh, you know, I saw this question, um, the bycatch, I, I kind of just was, you know, I'm, I know, understand that there are fish, you know, all fisheries have bycatch, et cetera, but that's really more geared towards the trawl, trawl fishery. So that's kind of surprised to actually see that question here, but I guess it has some relevance as well. But, um, is there been any, uh, well, I'm sure you have data now supporting bycatch on trawl fisheries. So I'm just going to leave it at that. Yeah, we do. So our data sources for uh, bycatch in the trawl fishery are the, uh, through the federal observer programs. And so they're, that's the bycatch analysis that they're talking about um, with Rick Starr at Moss Landing Marine Lab. So he's taking their data and uh, basically analyzing it like specifically for the halibut fishery. So yeah, we should have I, we don't know when that report will be ready, um, but that's something that we're working on right now. Yeah, there was other something else too that uh, someone had mentioned to me uh, in the recreational sector and they were discussing uh, boat limits. Um, is that something that would be in this discussion here as well? You understand what boat limits are, that when somebody catches their limit, they put their rod down and um, everybody else continues to fish until they achieve their limit. That's something that was brought up to me that I'm gonna just put here, just throw it out there in discussion, so. I'll, I'll, I'll jump in on that one. You know, you know CPFB yeah. operators strongly oppose the boat limit thing. You end up with uh, your worst fisherman on the boat <laughs> trying to catch the last fish <laughs> so you could go home. Oh, yeah. yeah, not not the worst fishing, mo most unlucky. <laughs> yeah, however you want to look at it, <laughs> they make their own luck sometimes. Yeah, I just had to throw it out there, so don't 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 yell at me. So, <laughs> yeah. Um. Okay, so we, I think we talked about this a little bit, but next question, how if at all are changing ocean conditions in the past 20 years impacting the halibut fishery and your livelihood? I haven't really seen a big change. Um, there, I've definitely seen some cycles go through the bay, like I said, with um, forage fish and stuff, you know, anchovies, herring, sardines, that sort of thing but I haven't really seen, I, I really haven't seen any other issues like that. So you've maybe seen things on like a smaller scale, um, like natural weather cycles, like El Nino, La Nina, but on like a bigger scale, we don't think there's an impact. That's, yeah, that's okay. correct. Well, for me in the Bay Area, there's, I've seen everything from the pelagic red crabs, bonito here in the Bay Area, um, and a trigger fish, uh, giant sea bass. Um, I've seen so many different changes 
all these years, um, how it affects my livelihood. Well, white sea bass has shown up pretty well over the last 20 years and taken root here. Um, and are actually spawning and going through their processes of life. So it adds to my livelihood. Again, I'm speaking, I don't, I'm probably on the wrong form here, but it adds to my livelihood for sure because the diversity changes. And so the marketing has, you know, white sea bass is a desirable fish quite for sure, it's for certain, but um, it does offer opportunity the changes, whether or not it's climate change, I don't know, but changing oceanic conditions, yeah, but they change all the time. It's not like right now we have a really warm water situation going on here. Inside the bay, it's 65 to 70 degrees. Outside and lately, it's um, today and yesterday, it's 63 degrees. And uh, earlier on in the year, believe it or not, it was 52 degrees, 51 degrees, and even got down in, in the 49 degrees. So the, ch the changes here are, are dynamic. It's, it's constantly changing all the time. But like I say, over time, over a period of time, I've seen, like I say, pelagic red crabs and, and things that don't belong here, here, Benita, here, you know, right here in the bay, cat catching in, the, in just outside the bay here. So what you attribute that to, how does, how does it affect my livelihood? Yeah, it does affect my livelihood because different water temperatures, different uh, species, if they're marketable, sure, they, they affect my, my livelihood as well. That makes sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Ed, so it sounds like you're seeing like a change in the species in your location, maybe associated with um, climate. So Tim, do you think halibut is like one of those species for you? <laughs> or do you think, or have you seen other types of species show up in your area that you think are associated with climate? We haven't seen, I mean, we do see an, a, an occasional rare, you know, fish that shouldn't be here show up, but it, generally those fish are coming over on the same, coming in with the same current that brings the albacore and stuff, you know, like last week, a marlin washed up on the beach in Crescent City. I mean, that's not something you see every day, but there's a patch of really warm water off of Crescent City that's got a lot of albacore and stuff in it, and, uh, you know, you, I, I've seen that come in real close some years. I've seen it stay way offshore some years. Um, I don't see a consistent, you know, where we're seeing that kind of stuff every year, year after year. And it, and I'm not seeing the, you know, we haven't seen pelagic red crab in here. Or, you know, I think 30 years ago, we had some bonita out in front of Humboldt Bay for a couple of weeks. But other than that, I haven't really seen a big, any substantial long-term trend that I could point a finger at. Okay. Yeah, it wasn't necessarily long-term as discussing. I'm just saying that there's there's always change. There's always change. What you attribute it to, I don't know, because the, the, the diversity, I mean, the difference is so extreme, like not, you have normal, which would be considered normal 55, 60 degree, well, 55, 60 degree water, bringing those kind of associated species. And then you have these other outlier years that are so extremely different that bring other species as well. But it's it's not something that's long-term, it's just something that's dynamic. Mm -hmm. okay. I just wanna pop on to say that we have about four minutes left before we automatically get booted back into the main session. It can be a little bit abrupt and jarring. So if that happens, um, just know that happens. And Christine and Chuck and me as a, as a fly in the wall have really enjoyed the conversation. Just wanted to say that in case we get booted, but let's carry on. Okay, all right, final question then. Uh, based on your understanding of the halibut fishery, do you have recommendations related to the sustainability of the resource, bycatch habitat, climate change, or socioeconomics? Um, yeah, actually. It, I, since I'm seeing more participation in the fishery up here, um, that means you got to cut back something somewhere else. So I would not have a problem with a two fish limit up here in Humboldt Bay. Um, and nothing uh, personal with Eddie there, but I don't, I don't see the real benefit of a commercial fishery 
for halibut in Humboldt Bay, you know, it's not a consistent fishery year after year. Nobody's making a living at it. It's just, you know, a couple of guys. In fact, they generally sell them on the street corner and stuff, the fish that they catch, you know, they'll set up a little stand with some stuff, which is, that's kind of a cool thing and stuff, but it's not, it hasn't been reliable enough to, um, you know, none of those guys are making a living at that, let's put it that way. Tim Restes, yeah, I'm not looking to make a fishery up there or start anything up there. I'm just asking, you know, questions. I'm kind of getting a, a, a comparison between Humble Bay area and what you guys are doing up there to down here, what's going on down here. Um, another, uh, you say a two fish limit. Um, a two fish limit, does that mean you're going to have only one trip a day or do you make multiple trips because you can limit the boat out faster and mix uh, multiple trips? No, I think. I just make, nobody here is making two trips a day. They make two trips a day for rockfish in Trinidad and that's, mm -hmm. we, we don't do two trips a day out of Eureka and don't plan on it. I'm trying to make the fishery last longer. That's what I'd like to see. I understand, I'm right with you. I'm right with you hundred percent. Keep it, keep it sustainable. I think my only recommendation is pretty obvious but I think there's, there's clearly, um, Different behavior, different trajectories of these, um, and fishing pressure and everything in the what we're calling the northern and the southern population. And so, I think it it is obvious, but I would just hope that um, these recommendations would would recognize that and not be a you know um, one size fits all for the state um, in terms of uh, what we what we ultimately decide to do. Yeah. Like uh, one other thing before we get booted out here, um, there was also discussion about um, limited entry for boats for participants like limited entry for six packs we're going to be booted here 